So many of these fights around communications rights tend to happen in DC, far away from the communities most impacted. It is crucial for our communities to be able to be heard, to be able to tell our stories, and, and for the folks in DC to not make any decisions around policy without us. Um, I'm extremely honored to be here tonight with y'all in, in LA on Skid Row. We're gonna hear some incredible stories of struggle and stories of resilience. Um, we're especially excited to welcome Commissioner Clyburn into this space. Um, she's one of the few DC leaders out there that really is willing to come to the community and hear from folks and ask questions and take those fights back with, them, with her to DC. So we're honored to have her here. Um, for folks following online, you can follow hashtag connecting communities in order to uh, participate in the conversation. Uh, we also have um, cards which will make their way around. We have a pretty packed agenda, but if folks wanna share their stories, we wanna, really wanna take those back to DC, so we'll have some cards for people to write down comments so we can take that back. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Shruti Goodwin from LA Can, who can tell us a little bit more about this um, space and history. We here at LA Can are just feeling very honored to have you folks come out and listen to the stories from a community that is over-policed and often um, found to be lacking in all of the areas of freedom and liberties that you will find in other communities. So we first wanna thank the voices uh, for Internet Freedom, that coalition that has come together to hold this very important conversation within our community. Um, just a little about LA Can. We've been around for nearly 20 years, and our work revolves around those people who are um, extremely poor, and that you, if you came in by uh, Sixth Street or just about any other street, you'll see that there are tents in almost every foot along uh, our street. So these are people who are unhoused um, and often don't have the resources needed to get by on a daily basis. So you could imagine how important having access to uh, the internet would be for these folks. Um, LA Can provides uh, advocacy as well as policy making that impacts the lives of the extremely poor and, and houseless. We also have um, some services available to them too. We're a service provider. We have a legal clinic. You might have noticed it's meeting at the same time tonight as we are on the other side of the building. And uh, we have, we're fortunate to have uh, legal aid attorneys to come in and meet with people on Skid Row that have gotten these tickets for jaywalking or having a tent that extends out too far on the curb or spitting. Uh, you know, so that's why I say we're over-policed. Uh, so we have a clinic that meets with them. We, uh, you know, there's also um, a massive problem down here with housing as gentrification has pushed our community to the far east side um, and so we have lawyers that meet with our residents to prevent more gentrification and more evictions um, we also if you went upstairs you saw our rooftop garden we have uh, uh, vegetables and herbs that we sell to local um, hotels that use them in their kitchens. Uh, we also have a pop-up market where folks can put in an order for reasonable um, organic fruits and vegetables every week. So um, we're just really proud of our space and happy that you could be here with us. So I'm actually gonna turn it over really quick um, to Alex Nogales from the National Hispanic Media um, Coalition to introduce uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you, Randy. Where's the commissioner? There she is. So, 
about eight years ago, at the National Hispanic Media Coalition realized that if we didn't pay attention to telecommunications, Latinos were not going to have a say in everything that was going on in Washington, D.C. Can you use the mic, can't hear me? Sure, hang on one second. Could you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. No? <laughs> yes. How about right now? Yeah. All right. I just needed to get closer. Thank you very much. So I'll start from there. About eight years ago, we decided that uh, the National Hispanic Media Coalition had to be in Washington, D.C. because there were many telecommunication issues that were coming down the pike and was not a Latino voice. And so we sent someone out there and then we hired an attorney. And since that time, we have been deeply, deeply involved in telecommunications and all of the issues of the day. First and foremost, the one that we're going to pay a lot of attention to today, net neutrality, okay? Now we went down there and we didn't know what to expect, uh, who the commissioners were or whatever, but we quickly um, found our champions. And among our champions was Commissioner Claiborne. Yes. She has been unfailing in her support for people of color, for people everywhere, color or not, that need a break in terms of just rates for our internet, um, everything that we want to do on the internet. So let me tell you a little bit about her. I've known her now for several years, and she's always been very charming and very gracious. And I thank you for all that and all the attention and time that you have spent with us, educating us about one or another of the issues. She went to the University of um, South Carolina. and. Uh, Somebody's from there too? And then she took over the reins of her family's um, newspaper. And she was there for 14 years. It's a long time to be the publisher to run a uh, publication. Then she went to the, um, this I found fascinating. I knew it, but then I forgotten about it. She went to the PSC of South California and she was there for 11 years. That's a lot of knowing of regulations, a lot of knowing of the political part of what this means. And as you all know, you're all very versed on, on this is a very political type of situation because you have people that are for something and people that are against. So there's constant fight at all times. Then she was nominated to be at the FCC. Uh, our president, Obama, nominated her, she was confirmed by the Senate, and here she is. She is in her second term, and she has dealt, dealt with many of the issues that we hold dear. To me, one of the biggest ones is Lifeline, as you well know. Another one is net neutrality. We finally won net neutrality. You all remember that, right? Yeah. That was a big one. And now it's under attack. As you know, there's uh, three members of the FCC Commission in, one, at, uh, in Washington, D.C. One is a, uh, a Democrat, a lone Democrat, that is Commissioner Piper, and two Republicans, one of which is the chair, who has been at the FCC for several years now, and should know better, but he doesn't want to. And so he is dismantling as quickly as he can net neutrality, lifeline, and everything that that has to do with that. So she is here to hear from all of us as to what the internet means to us. And I hope that you will be very blunt, direct, and honest with her, because this is not something that we can do without. You know, the internet net neutrality has given us the ability to afford to be connected at a reasonable price. It has allowed us to be on the same tour uh, here, excuse me, as the main corporations of America, Verizon, AT&T, um, all of them. So uh, one price for all of us, and that's great. Nobody has a slowdown in terms of speed because the FCC has made sure that that is the case. Without the internet, folks, we don't have the ability to put out applications for jobs. We don't have the ability for educational purposes as well. And look, we can't afford to not be connected. We're going to be left behind. All of us, whether you're uh, people of color or whites that cannot afford these kinds of things. So we have to fight for it all over again. Now, it's an uphill battle. It's not gonna be easy, but we have a champion. 
we have a champion, and I, I present her to you, and I ask you to give her the applause, a warm felt applause that we all feel for her. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So first, let me uh, thank um, Alex Nogales, not only for that wonderful introduction and for his friendship, but for investing more than three decades defending and advancing employment and programming equity uh, for Latino Americans in the communication space. Thank you so very much, and please give him an applause for that. Now, I rarely begin a message on a solemn note, but I feel the need to share with you this evening that a small part of me is a little down. Now, I say this because those forces that are so entrenched on the other side of this policy debate, they seemingly refuse to listen. If they were to listen, they would witness just how incredible it is to hear from so many of you People who care about keeping the internet open for free and free, and if they cared, if they took a moment to just listen, they would gain a better understanding of what preserving consumer privacy protections and ensuring that the public airways reflect the diversity of our local communities, they would know how much that means for us in our communities. But while I may have approached the mic a little melancholy, I feel increasingly by the seconds uplifted because I am in a room full of people that know, as we say back home, what time it is. <laughs> I am grateful for the Voices for Internet Freedom for organizing today's forum, to the Los Angeles Community Action Network for hosting us, and for all of the supporting organizations, you know who they are, including Free Press, CMJ, NHMC, Color of Change, 18 Million Rising and Common Cause. These are advocates who are working for you. And while some of them um, uh, you might not know, they know you. They might not know you by name, but they know you. They know what you need and you want, they, what you want. They know and are willing to listen. So I wanna thank all of you because there are a lot of things you could be doing with your time tonight. I know a lot of you invested time in work. I know for a fact a lot of you invested time in traffic and transportation. But you are here this evening because you know what time it is. Now, I hope I don't embarrass this person, and I'm going off script, so I am uh, going to um, get my uh, advisor a little nervous. But I want to speak to you about somebody you might know, and I won't mention her, real, her, her given name, but uh, you know her as Frenchie. Now, Frenchie uh, came up to me as soon as I walked in the door and said, you look like your picture. Now, she wasn't telling the truth, but I thanked her anyway. <laughs> and she reminded me what time it is and why we are here and why this is so important. I hope I'm not embarrassing you when I say this. She said to me that I, something to me that I think that I will continue to message each and every time I come to the mic and talk about these issues. She said, even when I was at my most challenging time, challenged time, I had the ability to stay connected, to stay on the radar screen, because I had a, a, I, I had a domain name, in essence. I had my own name. You know, I had a, an internet connection. You know, I had an address. I had an internet address. And that just hit me because even if you don't have a permanent address, even if your address is in one of these tents, the power of broadband, the power of connectivity, the power of an openness of this internet, internet ecosystem allows you to have an address, an identity, a way to stay connected. Now, I could read to you all of the things, and they're important, and we'll talk about it um, you know, uh, uh, during uh, the conversation. I could tell you what you already know, that the power of being connected enables you to find the job of your dreams, 
the opportunities of your dreams, the educational experiences and, uh, uh, that you need to be uplifted. It allows you to be in touch with your doctor. You don't have to take six buses to get to your medical professional. It allows you to stay connected and to, to have the ability to realize your greatest objectives. But I think about Frenchie and all of this. And I think about what she said and the passion in her eyes. That this gave me an address when I didn't have one. Now I can talk to you about 20% of Americans only having you know, one or maybe at best two choices for a broadband provider and what that means in terms of cost and opportunities. It means higher costs and fewer opportunities. I can tell you about what has happened in Cleveland, Ohio, and what that means for us. What happened in the Cleveland area is that we found, they found, that a major service a broadband provider had, and I quote, systematically discriminated against lower income neighborhoods in its deployment of home internet and video technologies over the past 10 years. That's what they found. And what does that mean? That means that if we're rich, we've got no problems in terms of connectivity. The infrastructure is going to be built in our communities. We don't have any real problems with terms of choice. And we definitely don't have a problem with connectivity. But if we're on the other side of the track, if we are with, uh, on 6th Street, and I don't know all my streets here, um, so forgive me for that, but if we are in this community, the investments are not flowing here. That means the opportunities will not flow here. That means people like me have to stand up and speak for you and, and say, look, here, on Skid Row, in Los Angeles, in communities large and small, rural and urban, poor and rich, we all deserve to be connected. And any one element that we ignore at the FCC when it comes to affordability, when it comes to inmate calling, when it comes to any other means or platform that will allow you be to connected, when it comes to the media space, when it comes to ensuring that the people you see in the movies and on the television, that they look, sound, talk, and have the same interests as you, all of those things are important. If we don't bring those issues to the fore, if we don't challenge, if you don't challenge people like me who have the opportunity, who have the means, who took an oath to make a difference, then shame on all of us. Because we will leave communities behind that need connectivity and broadband the most. Now over four million people filed comments. They broke our website. It got broken again the other day, you might have heard. <laughs> but they weighed in and they say, we want a free and open internet for all. Yes. Now in a, be in a week, you're going to hear about another path we might take. You're going to hear about an item that's being teed up at the FCC that will reverse course on all of this. Are you going to be silent? No. Are you going to be silent? No. So I say to you that no matter the politics, no matter what we tee up at the FCC, no matter what the challenges we have, no matter the fights, no matter what they say that we can't do or we shouldn't do or what direction we should go, you know what your communities need. You know the charge we are supposed to, or the obligation we have to serve you. You know that an, your internet service provider should not favor one, entity or one person over you. You know that a free, open, robust, and fair internet is going to empower and enable, and enable our communities. You know that. I know that. All of us at the FCC know that. But in order to do that, in order to make sure that that happens, it's going to take you. Your voice has to be heard. No matter how difficult it gets, no matter how the vote 
falls on next week and the next week and the next, you cannot allow that to be the final answer. You give the final answer. You have the final say-so. And a free and open internet is the final answer. And if you believe in that, Let's have a conversation about that. If you believe in that, then you need to go to FCC.gov, dial that 888 number, call us and let us know. Because one thing I do know, in a sea of uncertainty, one thing I do know, if you do not speak up, if your voices are not heard, then the people who have another plan will fulfill that plan. That's certain. We might not be certain about what's gonna happen in terms of decisions, but we will be certain what will happen if you do not act or speak up. So allow this to be yet another reminder of the power of one voice, two voices, or a hundred voices in this room. You've got the wherewithal I know, the opportunity I trust, and I know the capacity to make a difference. You make a difference, make your voices be heard, and I guarantee you that this partner will be right there in the trenches on Skid Row or whatever row we need to make a difference. Thank you very much. How y'all doing? Good. We're gonna try that again. How y'all doing? There we go. Um, my name is Steven Renderos. I am the organizing director at the Center for Media Justice, one of the groups that's organizing this event tonight. Uh, me, personally, I'm super excited to be hosting this kind of an event in my hometown. Uh, I grew up just on the other side of downtown in Koreatown. Um, yep. And, uh, and I'm excited to, to be having this conversation tonight. My organization believes that the right to communicate uh, and therefore the right to transform our society belongs to everyone. And as one of our member organizations from a network that we host says, movements begin with the telling of untold stories. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna tell some untold stories. Um, so I'd love to invite up uh, General Jeff, Susan, and Marcos to come up and just grab a seat in front of one of the microphones. Where is Susan? Carol? Oh, here we go. Yep, we got you. And then wherever Marcos might be. Cool, hi Marcos. Marco, Marco. Uh, awesome. So, I wanted to, we have like a set of seven people that are gonna come up and deliver some wonderful stories, so we'll spend about 15 minutes with each, and the format for this is gonna be, I'm gonna ask um, you know, folks a question and you know, get some responses. Commissioner Clyburn, at any point, if there's a question you'd love to ask, please feel free to dive in. Um, but we're in, the middle of Skid Row. So what I wanted to do is kind of frame, start the conversation there, you know, and talk about the unhoused and the disconnected. And I want to start with you, General Jeff, for you to talk to us about kind of your own personal experience, experiences being here in Skid Row, um, being formerly unhoused, and how you just navigated the challenge of trying to stay connected to the platform that you needed to be connected to at the time, whether that was a telephone or the internet. Thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, for my name is General Jeff. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the Center for Media Studies. Thank you to Los Angeles Community Action Network. Thank you, Stop LEPD Spine Coalition, for having me to be on this esteemed panel tonight, along with my fellow panelists. Um, I'm born and raised in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, been in Skid Row, uh, reduced myself by design to a state of homelessness, and, and, and came to Skid Row in August of 2006. Um, and I'm, proud, I'm say, proud to say that I'm a proud Skid Row resident. A lot of people don't understand what that means, but there's a lot of sense of community in Skid Row. Um, let me first just say there's a lot of, uh, just for sake, since this is about communications, um, there's a lot of mispronunciation uh, and the misnomers uh, that go out about Skid Row. So I don't live on Skid Row, I live in Skid Row. In, is a, in Skid Row is a geographical place. On Skid Row is a state of mind. I've never been on Skid Row, even though I've been living here for almost 11 years now. There is a difference, and I hope that the media, the, the FCC, and everyone else would respect our community to the point to say that we live in Skid Row, a physical place. Thank you. I'm also the chair of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee. We're in the process of creating our own neighborhood council, our own governing body, so that we can create opportunities 
to help our fellow members in our community to be connected, to be not only connected to the, the, the resources um, and the solutions in City Hall, but of course all the way up to Sacramento where the state capital is and all the way to Washington, D.C. Uh, where our representatives are there. We definitely want to thank uh, Commissioner Claiborne for uh, joining us tonight. Um, you know, I, I just want to be frank, even though my name is Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be frank, I like that guy. No, but um, you know, I try to lighten up the mood because it's a serious topic and a lot of people, it's hard, it's hard for them to digest the, any discussions and truth discussions about Skid Row. So when we think about America, we think about capitalism, a capitalist society. That's what we all live in here in this country. And a lot of the solutions are based on a trickle-down theory. Um, unfortunately, here in Skid Row, we're at the bottom of life's totem pole, and so it's like a drizzle, but the, the, the drizzle evaporates before it actually trickles down all the way down to the bottom. So when we have uh, uh, great solutions that look good on paper, um, they usually fail in terms of actually reaching the very people that are in need of the, the services that, the most. So when we talk about the internet, you know, there are a lot of uh, programs you, that have uh, government subsidized uh, phones that they give away, free phones. You see several numerous organizations set up their own canopy, set up an outreach table around the corner and say, hey, anybody want a free phone? You know, that's great service, but how do homeless people charge their phones? Mm -hmm. You know, so if there's no wireless charging network system that's in place as well, then, you know, as soon as that phone dies, you got to go get another free phone. So now that, that the metrics are off, because now they're thinking, oh, there's a whole lot of units being used, consumed in Skid Row. Well, it's not that, it's not true metrics because it's the fact that the previous phone the person had, once it's dead, you throw it away and then you just simply go get a new phone. It's easier to do that than to go try to charge up the one that you had that just died. So, um, you know, there's definitely need for solutions and, and us living with real-time solutions on the, uh, in the community, you know, we have numerous, numerous solutions and um, I don't want to take up all the time on the panel but mm. I don't know I just want to start with that one and also say that through the Skid Row Neighborhood Council the creation of it's still a fight and it's unfortunately there are a lot of uh, powers that be a lot of powerful forces in Skid Row that don't think that the Skid Row Neighborhood Council is in the best interest of our community which in and of itself is, is ludicrous but it, it, it creates a more of a divide when we're talking about connectedness we're trying to connect more and so with that I want to stop unless yeah. you have other questions and, and, and allow That's pass great. the mic to my panelists. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in, in the same way that I think powers that be want to limit the neighborhood council from being, you know, raised here in Skid Row, um, you see similar forces happening at a national level trying to prevent the voices of people online um, from being protected through rules like net neutrality. So they, they happen in digital and offline spaces as well. You talked about um, charging cell phones. And it's interesting, the other day that I was here visiting, prepping for this forum, um, one of the organizers here at LA Can, General Dogon, was looking for a generator so that they could do just that, get people connected so that they can you know, charge their cell phones. And it's an interesting dynamic that institutions like LA Can have to fill this place of like really trying to service the community. And I wanted to take it to you, Susan, to talk to us about a different type of institution that provides a lot of access to the internet for people, the library. In your experience, uh, you being formerly unhoused, living in Skid Row, can you talk to, about, talk to us about how you navigated staying connected to the internet? Well, to Get close to the microphone, the internet, just because I've been an internet user for a long time. You might want to just pull up the microphone close to you to talk to you. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank I've you. used the internet for many years, and uh, so there was no way I was going to ever do without it once I became actually, I guess you, you get so dependent upon it, you can't imagine not having it. So even becoming homeless meant that I'd have to find it somewhere, and the library was the place. And although it's limited what you can do at the library, there's, you know, there's limited access to the library, you know, for what you can even look at. And um, there's just a limited amount of time, and that's all you get in the day. So that makes it a little difficult, but it's there for you every day. So uh, that, that gives you the opportunity to, you know, to, to use it. And also the Women's Center gives you, a, will give you a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, also the shelter I stayed in, they had um, internet access, but that was also not as accessible as it could have been in that particular shelter. 
and also there's not that many uh, units to use or computers to use and so it's important because I wouldn't have even found the shelter if it hadn't been for the internet. Mm. I wouldn't even been able to find my way. I even got my ticket online to get to LA, to get to the shelter, to start, you know, to end this homeless cycle that I had fallen into. Mm. So without it, I don't think I would have even, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you. Marco, um, kind of picking up, piggybacking off of that a little bit, um, you know, as a health advocate, um, I imagine that the internet plays a role nowadays for people in terms of like information that they need to access for their health. And I'm just curious if you could speak to just what some of the effects are of, um, especially nowadays where a lot of health information is transitioning online, a lot of services are transitioning online. Like what's the impact of that for people that are looking for information to, to better their healthcare? Yes, I am. Um, I, I am, uh, I've been dealing with HIV and uh, really, really uh, difficult mental health issues in the past year after my father passed away. I'm a filmmaker and I was in the middle of uh, releasing my, my first uh, feature length documentary um, and then I got really sick. Um, I, I, I had insurance because I was working for a, a National Civil Rights Organization doing HIV work. And in a matter of like uh, four months, I was on the streets. Uh, not literally, because uh, Latinos tend to take care of each other, and my family in Long Beach have been housing me since uh, December. Uh, but, I, but I don't have a job, so I can. Uh, although I'm, I'm working, I'm working, I do volunteer work. Um, and so the, the issue of with uh, access to online uh, tools uh, for, for patients that are dealing with mental health, in my case, mental health has been the most difficult thing that I've ever experienced, a lot more difficult than HIV. To find a therapist, mm. I actually find a therapist in, in Fresno, and so we used to Skype, uh, and that's how I got some of uh, culturally relevant the care that I wanted and that I deserve. And, and then mm, there's another person that is in Argentina. So um, those were the people that were helping me. The people that I will go and try to find here, they, they will never pronounce my name correctly um, to begin with. And, and so it's, it's difficult. Uh, in my case, I transitioned from like my regular doctor to medical still waiting for some, some of that. And, um, and but my, my previous doctor, uh, basically, we couldn't really call for an appointment. We need, we need to do that online. And if you were late or if you're gonna, if you were mentally health, mental, if you have mental health issues, um, the doctors charge you like uh, a ridiculous amount of money because you're late or you, you don't make to the appointments. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm sick. Um, so, so all of you have to do that all, all, all online. Um, and at the moment that you realize that you don't have access to um, to broadband to to the web, then uh, like like um, like Susan was saying, it's like that's how the, you feel like um, as if your hands were yeah. Mm. That's really, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, General Jeff, you do a lot of work around public health. Can you talk a little bit about just the relationship between, you know, this platform we, we all use today or a lot of folks use and depend on the internet and the, the advocacy that you've been doing around public health? Like what, what relationship do you see there? Um, when I moved to Skid Row in 2006, I didn't even have an email address. I didn't even know what the email was. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty much where my community activism started from. It was just, um, I was just a word of mouth, you know, boots on the ground, talk to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so once I started accumulating all of these different uh, energies and different stories, um, how do I uh, transfer and, and, and share that information with, with those in positions of power 
and resources that could actually help them. And so I became like the connector to try to connect the dots. And so I, I myself needed to be connected and online so that I could help my constituents. And so through that, I was able to build up a database um, of, of it through various different topics. And, you know, just for instance, say if, um, you know, there are people that are uh, suffering, and everybody knows, commonly knows, Skid Row is the uh, homeless capital of America. And so through that, there's a high concentration of homeless. There's also a high concentration of people that suffer from mental illness. And there are a lot of times when people can't make it to their doctor, to their healthcare professional to be treated. So there's a wonderful place where if they had a cell phone or, or some type of way that they could actually speak to a doctor. You know, the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health has a $3 billion budget. And so I'm um, on the uh, Los Angeles County Health Agency Integrated Envi Advisory Board. And so one of the things that I try to portray and, and get them to do um, is to have some type of 24-hour hot hotlines. So when people are actually having an episode, they can just simply, you know, like if Dr. Phil was my counselor, you know, if I'm having an episode at three o'clock in the morning, I'm, not, I'm never by myself, I'm a phone call away. Even I could, if someone could help me program my phone to speed dial, one button, I've got access to Dr. Phil. Help me, I'm going through something, just talk, me, talk to me for a minute. And that'll help stabilize a person's uh, situation, just, you know, just to have a staff, kind of like with any other companies where they have tech support, 24-hour tech support. You know, we need 24-hour mental health support. You know, that, that's just one, uh, you know, again, just numerous, so many solutions. Um, say, for instance, we have a lot of uh, disabled, a lot of elderly um, in our community for, uh, if they need to uh, get public transportation to get to their healthcare professional, it's vulnerable in a dangerous community to just stand outside on a bus stop or waiting for, you know, access or Uber or Lyft or whatever your trans mode of transportation mm -hmm. is. It's dangerous for some of our our, our constituents to just be uh, outside. So it helps if they could actually just, you know, get access to the internet, so we're talking about through the Department of uh, Transportation, where they could actually connect with them and tell them at this specific corner that you designate, transportation will be there in say 35 minutes. So that way you don't have to have a 30 minute wait. You can actually wait till, you know, five, 10 minutes just before then. If it takes you seven minutes to get there, by the time you get there, you can map out your whole transportation route so that you can actually walk in. Even at the healthcare professionals themselves, um, you can coordinate and have your time of your mode of transportation so that you arrive exactly just mo just before your, your, uh, your appointment. And so that way people can maximize their times in, in, in doing other things mm -hmm. to uh, help help improve their lives. So there are numerous solutions, but I'm, I'm glad that these uh, conversations are actually happening. Yeah, and I think in, in Marco's, uh, Marco, your example, I think really highlighted the potential for technology to deliver for what you needed in that moment it was culturally specific um, healthcare. You found it in you know, hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away, but we had a platform that allowed for you to, you know, access that information um, and access that care. And I think similarly in thinking about solutions here in Skid Row, um, the trickle-down effect really needing to be in a format that makes sense for the community here. Um, so I want to take it to Susan and then one more question to Marco and then I want to transition us. Uh, Susan, you've talked to me about being a network neutrality supporter, um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, but you've also talked to me about um, just concerns that you have about the amount of information that is collected when you go online. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Well, I don't know if I'm the specialist on that in that area, but I do know that, um, that there's a lot of data mining, mining going on now. And, you know, once you become a, a data set, you're like the product that they're seeking now. And... Um, that, then also there's they're putting limits and logarithms on you so that they can guide you to the data that they want you to see and you know you don't you, you're not able to see everything now it's, you know I they can even figure out what your likes and dislikes are and profile you and there's a whole you know you can be cut out of a, an entire data you know uh, set that you might be interested in, but um, it's a little, it's getting a little scary and also like net neutrality is very important to me because 
Um, you know, like I have internet access now in the you know, SRO sort of like situation that I'm living in now. And um, if they were to cut me off so that I'm not paying much for it, so that the big users here in downtown Los Angeles that are, you know, businesses had absolute access mm -hmm. at fast speeds and then you know, that's happened to me because um, one time I, I couldn't get a internet access because some, there was something had happened. It was a windy day, and so they had to re-channel because of a, a uh, transformer blew or something, and so they had to re-channel access, and so it slowed down. And it was so slow that I couldn't load some pages. And, you know, that was really kind of scary. I'm thinking, wow, that could happen. It could happen because I'm not the um, big important user that they're really catering to. It could happen if we were to lose net neutrality. And um, I'm, I'm just really, you know, just a concerned citizen. I don't know if I know all there is to know about that, but I know there's something there. Exactly. Um, Marco, I want to take it to you for the last question here. Um, you know, being in kind of the, the mental health activist, can can you speak to this question around privacy a little bit, and just any concerns that you have about, um, you know, the, you know, concerns with like information being out there in, on the internet, and any concerns that you've come across with folks that you work with? Yes. Well, it's uh, something very real for people. Uh, the stigma. Uh, <clears throat> People talk about a stigma around mental health issues and I call it discrimination. I don't think that, well, of course stigma exists, but the effect is a, is a discriminatory effect. I say very openly to people that my friends and my family and everybody else that was supposed to help me when I was going through this crisis for almost a year, uh, they made my life more difficult. And one of the issues is, is, is privacy. Um, because in my case, I, I made the commitment to be open about my mental health issues since from the very beginning so I could fight um, back stigma, um, just as I do with HIV AIDS um, or, or immigration. It's not a disease, but we are treated as if we are um, sick, although they're the ones that are sick. Um, so, so I think that the, the, um, it's incredibly, it's, it's for people uh, in my community, in the Latino community, it's incredibly difficult to trust folks that um, hold any official position. Because those are the people that are coming to my schools and, uh, and, and deporting, deporting my mom or my dad, right? So it's very difficult, and from, the, from before, um, this this new president, um, it, we, it was always a, an impediment for Latino folks to actually, um, and also because uh, language justice, um, it's difficult to know um, what is it that uh, where, where is the, the your information is going is if you don't really understand the language. Mm -hmm. And um, I have witnessed for the past couple months living in Long Beach with my with my cousin. Um, she has somebody who is mm, disabled. Well, she has cerebral palsy, my niece, uh, and, and it, it, nobody really offers any services in Spanish to her. And her and, and the right, uh, she has the right to actually have people um, speaking the language. So in my case, um, the the idea of providing just my information to people that are doing an intake was very stressful. Because I actually went through like five intakes um, of like two, two plus hours where you have to tell people everything that you don't want to talk about. And then at the end, you realize that they are not competent to help you. So, so for me, that was very tiring. I ended up, I ended up just, you know, one of the issues that I had with, with, with my depression and the anxiety is that I, I just didn't do anything. Um, the people that take the cars away took my car and I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. So my car, I don't know. I don't know what happened to my car because I haven't been able to even um, uh, finalize or, or 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 resolve that. 
But um, when you when you are going through depression, there are certain things that you cannot do that overwhelm you. And in my case, was basically doing the things that would prevent for me to have um, a financial hardship, which um, is really what happened. And it's interesting that you talk about a process of intake, because I think a lot of us can probably relate that to being most of our internet experience is one intake form after another, and data that be, that is collected. I know Commissioner Clyburn worked on a set of rules last year to set some guidelines for your internet service providers and what they can do with your data and protecting certain information, including medical like information. Um, this Congress, this current Congress, reversed that rule. So unfortunately, you know, internet service providers have the power to do whatever they want with the data they collect they on can us. Sell it. Um, right. And, and, and may I say also, when I didn't have any money, I explored opportunities for me to, 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 to get some money, some funds. Um, and so I, I went to try to see, uh, seek a loan, and I didn't t took any loans, but I still received a ton of information mm -hmm. on my, on, on, online. And then there is something where you actually learn about your records. So you enter all this information, like eight steps, and at the very end they just want to charge you money. And you obviously don't pay the money, but then after that you, you, uh, on, on uh, unsubscribe, right. but you still receive uh, emails after that uh, telling you there is one bad entry about you. Uh, ta -ra -ra -ra. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I was just reading one and I went ahead and I, I, I um, unsus unsubscribe again. Right. But, but I, I think that it's a predatory way to deal with uh, the, the most marginalized and the people that are the most um, that, that, that I was vulnerable. That's right. I, I find it, I, I was very surprised because I thought that it was bad. I, I, I just never thought that it was that, that bad. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, General Jeff. I want to invite um, Melissa and I want to invite Brittany to come up. <laughs> so we just talked about the experiences of being unhoused and disconnected. I want to talk to us about um, another place where technology is playing a very significant role in whether or not people have opportunity, and that's in the realm of education. Um, and I want to actually start us off um, with Brittany, because I know um, uh, there's an issue that Commissioner Clyburn has been extremely passionate about and done a lot of work in, um, and that's around the cost of phone calls from prisons. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience around that particular issue? Um, I'm not too sure how much it costs currently to a minute for my dad to, you know, pay. But um, I know that um, communication with me and him isn't the best, isn't even close to best or even good at all because well, currently he's only get allowed to call once a month for 15 minutes. And he's been in solitary confinement for about four years. He's out, luckily, this year. Um, and um, just growing up without him and just not having that communication with him, it's just, it sucks because he's fluent in, he's fluent in um, Spanish and my mom is fluent in both languages, but she raised me speaking only English so right there it's just like I wish we can get into deeper conversations because my Spanish really does it's horrible you know and it's and it's also sad because because I am a Latina woman but like I can't speak Spanish and um, my dad speaks only Spanish so how could I fix that relationship how could I you know, communicate with him in a deeper level um, with him being like 12 hours away from me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the costly effects of just like, with my mom being a sing single parent with like two kids, it's cost her a lot and I don't know how she did it. I don't. And um, yeah. Thank you. And I know that um, you, uh, as you mentioned to me, like you spent most of your life, basically your whole life, um, getting to know your father in this way, through mm -hmm. phone calls, through mm -hmm. 
the occasional visits, um, mm -hmm. you know, and traveling hundreds of miles to go visit him. Yeah. Um, can, you know, you're also a student, and can you talk to me about what you've noticed in terms of how important it's been for you to be connected to a platform like the internet um, for your education? Yeah, it's really important right now. Currently, I don't have Wi-Fi at home, so I freeload off of my neighbor, so <laughs> I have to get internet somehow. <laughs> But um, yeah, I have online classes sometimes. I have online quizzes. I'm a, I had a teacher who had me do online quizzes um, every week. And luckily my sister was paying the Wi-Fi at that moment and I had good speedy Wi-Fi. It was $60 a month. That's still a lot for my sister who's also a college student. Um, it's hard. So I have to, I just rely on my school's library. I end up going earlier. I get the printer there as well. Um, it just like I wish I had the Wi-Fi at home because sometimes I don't want to go to the library. Sometimes I want to be in my own space where I'm comfortable and I can just chill around and lounge. And um, I don't have that advantage. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, Melissa, um, you uh, taught in the Inglewood school system for over 14 years, and now you're currently teaching in a different district uh, in Torrance. Can you talk to us a little bit about the differences between those both those two districts? I imagine. Um, in terms of the student body, and also just from your experience, what you've seen as a teacher, um, the growth of the internet um, in the role of education. My name is Melissa, and I am a teacher. Um, and I did teach in Inglewood, is where I started my career and lasted there for over 14 years. And um, I am that teacher that assigns online homework, <laughs> even though I know my students don't have internet access. And even though I know that, I'm not going to hold them back um, because I, like many of you in here, know that they are the important ones. Um, they're going to be your doctors. They're going to be cures of horrible diseases. My students need to do great things. And if I don't assign online homework or online assignments, um, I'm just holding them back. So, to speak about um, the disadvantage that students have, it truly is a digital divide. Um, and unfortunately, it's a divide based on income, like you said. Mm -hmm. $60 a month, what could your sister do with $60? Yeah. In terms of mm -hmm. at a grocery store, mm -hmm. or shoes for you know mm -hmm. children or whatever. And so, for many families, it's not even, who wants to choose between food for your children or internet access? That shouldn't have to be a decision that parents should have to make. Um, and the digital divide is only increasing and with new Common Core state standards, which are not just state standards, they're national standards, and state testing that my students are required to do, which Monday we start. And they are, it's a test that's only online, and just tonight, I said, get online and do your practice test. I don't have a computer, remember? And I said, well, you gotta figure it out. And you know, it's funny, because I look at bottled water and I think about, um, there was a time where we didn't drink bottled water. We just went to the tap and drank water, and it wasn't something we thought about. And now we have bottled water, and I don't drink tap water. Um, why? I don't know, I just don't drink tap water. and. You know, without cell phones and without internet access, my students are still drinking tap water. They don't even realize that they have a choice. And unfortunately, it's to the situation where students, um, they're just at a, a big disadvantage. And it breaks my heart to see that they don't have any the same opportunities that other students do that have internet access at home. And being in Inglewood, which is not too far, and if you flew in, you flew right over the school where I was at last this past September. We, would, we were right in the flight path of LAX, and um, most of my students did not have a computer at home, or if they did, it didn't work. If they did have a computer, they had no internet access. If they did have internet access, it wasn't Wi-Fi. Um, mm -hmm. But they didn't really know any different. It wasn't like they had internet and then it was taken away and they were without it. If I leave my cell phone at home, I am panicking. <laughs> what am I gonna do? How am I gonna make a phone call? How am I gonna, I don't know anybody's phone number. So for adults and people like us that are, it's just internet access is like a body part. It's just part of us. Um, so to not have it is, 
it's difficult to understand. And my students in Torrance now, um, I still have quite a few students who do not have internet access, not as many, but I still teach at a Title I school where I have a large percentage of students that are on free lunch and free breakfast. And so that right there tells you that if they're getting free lunch and free breakfast, they most likely do not have internet access at home. And why don't they have internet access at home? Well, once again, $60 a month is not something that they would even consider when they can barely afford food and shoes and a toothbrush and an alarm clock and, you know, just the basic necessities. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do questions a little bit later, is that okay? Um, is that okay? Um, so, uh, Brittany, so speaking a little bit more to that, like what's the, how do you navigate that challenge? Like when there are moments where, you know, you don't have the internet at home um, or you don't have the device, like what are the things you have to do to like stay consistent with your education? Um, just try to, to just try to stay at school. I usually have a 10 a.m. class, and then my other class that's at four. So I usually stay in between that gap because I my first class ends like at 12. So I usually stay there from like 12 to like four, or just like use a Wi-Fi there to nap in the library, you know. Um, so I just try to stay at school as much as I can, and um, just try to use the library. But, um, yeah. And Melissa, have you noticed a big difference between um, the access that students, like, say, in Inglewood have versus, like, your current students out in Torrance? And what are some of those differences? Differences in access or different? Okay. Um, well, just numbers. Student population and demographics are different. And um, the... The ability to use a computer at home, for instance, my, I teach fifth grade. My students are currently researching a president report. Um, and my class has the most recent last 15 presidents. And Barack Obama is assigned to two of my students. And they, um, we've been using books from our, our school library. There's no books on Barack Obama and his full president presidency yet, because he's so fresh and so new, and so many great things to say about him haven't been written yet. But my student, he doesn't have a computer at home. So he's got the library at school, which has no books, or he's got the public library, which had one very tiny book, and he's got a computer at school. So if I'm not spending an hour with him doing his research, he has zero access to complete his project. A requirement that I'm requiring, because I'm driven by the Common Core state standards, which are driven by the state testing, and that's what he needs to do. But how can we expect students to grow up in a world and be, um, you know, citizens in our communities and do great things when there literally is no connectivity, no access for them to complete? their work and it's as basic as that like it really doesn't get any more difficult it's just as basic as they cannot do what is required of them a basic standard like how she is saying she can stay at the library or she can work I have a fifth grader I help him as much as I can but it's just not possible for him so yeah it reminds me a lot of like the bilingual education that they used to do here in LA when I went into school my cousin was put in in bilingual education I was put in in English only and a few years later, the program gets completely reversed, and she's now at a huge disadvantage. Um, so and it, uh, you see a lot of those parallels today, which is like the technology gap. When um, state testing yeah. moved from paper bubble over to computer testing, that was when it split. That was the reverse, like you're saying. And now it's with technology. And I am fortunate that we have a very generous donor at my school, where I currently am in Torrance. Um, who donated enough funds to where my students have one-to-one -one Chromebooks in their classroom. Yeah. And that has transformed my teaching night and day. And I am able to do incredible things in the classroom now. But that's because I had a donor that donated 40 Chromebook laptops to my students. But um, when I was in Inglewood, we had three carts of 40 laptops to share between a K6 a school. And we saw those computers every other week for maybe two hours. 
and I was expected to do these same things with two hours. It just was impossible asking. But teachers do it. I mean, we do incredible things. And, um, but nobody understands unless you are raising a child in a public school system, or you are a child in a public school system, or you are a teacher in a public school system. Um, yeah, the divide is increasing. And I see it. And it's just getting worse and worse. Mm. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Brittany. I'd like to invite uh, Lourdes and Takui up, please. So to close us out with like the kind of stories, um, we wanted to talk about um, how people navigate uh, connection, um, being kind of limited in resources. And we've got uh, Lourdes, hi there. Uh, and we've got Takui who will be uh, uh, with an interpreter. Um, and I wanna start with you, Lourdes. Um, you currently don't have internet access at home. Can you talk to us a little bit about why? And um, but you still use the internet, so can you talk to us about some of the things that you do on there? Good evening. I'm Lourdes uh, Pablo, a member of uh, the Filipino Workers Center. I live in Los Angeles. Well, I have uh, a laptop, but. I am not using my laptop. I just use that to play music because I don't have internet. Uh, before, when uh, I didn't have the a smartphone, I, uh, what do you call that? I had a modem which uh, I pay for $50 a month from Sprint. But since that is too expensive and I already had uh, a smartphone, so, I stopped using that. Now, there are times that uh, I cannot, I cannot uh, use my uh, phone for other <clears throat> purpose because it's not limited. And sometimes I ran out of data because I only had uh, four gigabytes, which is not enough because you want to watch um, anything and. Since I am far from my family, from my loved ones, I use internet to communicate. <coughs> Sorry. I use internet to communicate with them and to friends, to co teachers, our co workers. So it's really very important. Now, it is. <clears throat> I have unlimited means to use my phone because if I want to research on something, I cannot do that because if there is a call or a text, then the one that I am researching um, will be uh, will disappear and I don't know what to do. So it's really hard. Whereas if you have your computer, you can make use of the internet so you can maximize on um, how to use it. And not only that, we also use, as I have mentioned, I cannot afford um, to pay a very high fee for uh, internet. So <clears throat> we can also use um, internet to look for a job. So I don't have extra jobs, so my income is limited so to those who can afford <laughs> yeah. it's fine but for us because i am a caregiver and uh, i don't have a regular job and um, i am already a senior so it's hard also to find a better job because <laughs> uh, you could hardly do the job as what the young ones can do so I'm going to go to uh, Takui. Um, Takui, you are a recipient of a program known as Lifeline. Um, can you talk to us about the what you use your your phone for? And for folks, the Lifeline program is a program that allows families to access a cell phone or a landline phone at home. 
you know, to emergency, which is very important, if like, because like many times she had physical conditions and she had to call to emergency and, or call her kids so they can come and, you know, run to her right away. And it's very, very important because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for her to pay for her telephone bill and without the lifeline discount. So. She told me that many times that this way at least, uh, you know, she can use her line to call for, you know, for the needs she has for different things. I'm curious, would she be able to have a telephone otherwise? Like, would she be able to afford um, it if they, she didn't have a lifeline? Uh, yes, have a lifeline at Chalini. Got us telephone if you want to No, she says no A little closer to the microphone, sorry. Uh, <laughs> she says no, she won't be able because, you know, she's on a limited income. She's receiving only SSI and she won't be able to pay for the telephone. So this is a very big help for her. Thank you. Uh, Lourdes, um, you mentioned a little bit that you are a, you work as a caregiver. Um, uh, it's my understanding that it, recently there are a lot of like ways in which there are a lot of certifications that you need to get to be uh, an official caregiver, you know, and a lot of those certification tests happen online. Can you talk to me about just some of the challenges with trying to do these kind of certification tests, particularly if you're trying to do it on your phone? Um, it's hard to do it on the phone um, because as I have said, I am not well versed on uh, how to uh, operate it. So when there is an incoming call, um, the, uh, the one that I am uh, reading or searching will disappear so it takes me again hard time to go back to that so it's hard for us uh, if I can use my laptop which is uh, just sitting there then it would be better so if only um, we can have uh, internet access at a low rate it would be of great help to us because if we we can undergo training, online training too, and that is very important. And if you want to know more, you can research through the internet. But as I have said, if you have limited access, it's very difficult. Yeah. Sometimes I go to McDonald's and bring my laptop. It's very heavy and it's hard. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been there myself. And one of the reforms that happened last year that Commissioner Clyburn was a part of around this Lifeline program was to extend that to also include broadband internet so that folks could you know, have more affordable access to the internet at home. It's a program that's rolling out and hopefully soon, Lourdes, that'll help you have internet access at home as well. Wow, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Takui, thank you, Lourdes. Uh, we'll transition now from this section and I'll invite my colleague Jessica Gonzalez to lead us into the next section. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Hi, Jessica Gonzalez here. I'm the Deputy Director of Free Press, fighting for your rights to connect and communicate. I'd like to call the panelists up, please. We have five folks, and we might need an extra chair. We have Hernan Gal Galperin, Denise Cortez, Taz Ahmed, Tia Oso, and Sylvia Moore. And I want to invite the commissioner to jump in any time when you have a question, okay. feedback, or if you want to sit up here, we'll drag a chair over here for you too. <laughs> so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to everyone and then I'm going to turn it over um, to you all for remarks. 
Um, we have with us Hernan Galperin. Just raise your hand when I go through, because I'm not going to be in order here. He's an associate research professor at USC, focusing on the digital divide. Uh, Denise Cortez is an activist, storyteller, and oh, is an is a Southern California artist, excuse me, blogger and entrepreneur. She's the founder and owner of PearMama.org, um, which features art, culture, faith, and real talk about being a mom to six? Six? Six kids, yes. Yeah. Six wow. kids? Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yep. Happy Mexican Mother's Day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and navigating life as a woman, woman of color. We have Tia Oso who's national organizer with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. She coordinates the Black Immigration Network, which is a national network of 40 orgs, academics, activists, and faith leaders serving, serving African Americans and black immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean. We have, yeah, yeah. We have Sylvia Moore with Common Cause. She's Common Cause's Southern California organizer responsible for building strategy and public support for the various initiatives that they're working on with the community. And Taz Ahmed, an activist, storyteller, and politico based in LA. She's an electoral organizer by trade, mobilizing th thousands of Asian American and Pacific Islanders to the polls in over 17 different languages. That's impressive. Most recently, her work has been housed at 18 Million Rising. Nice. All right. So. These people's bios are incredible. We, I could have spent like all night, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna hear from these folks about what internet access means to them. And I'm, uh, I'm gonna have Hernan kick us off because he's done some extensive research about the digital divide here in LA. Thank you. And um, I wanna thank the organizers, um, Steve, Jessica, I'm an academic. Um, and this is, uh, as you probably imagine, not that usual type of meeting for me and it's so refreshing. It's really so refreshing to hear the stories um, from the users, from people, from activists, from people that are on the front line fighting for this causes. So thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Um, I come from a family of doctors and doctors, when you usually go to a doctor, the first thing is let's collect data, let's have a good diagnosis. So that's what we set out to do about the digital divide in LA. We set out um, with my colleagues and some students to gather all the data that we could on um, what the digital divide in LA looks like, both from the uh, perspective of what services are available, as well as from the perspective of how people are using and adopting those services. So in this limited time, I wanna give you a snapshot of some of the most uh, important findings. The first thing is, it, uh, we were surprised, is even though LA is a very highly urbanized county, there's still residents who live in areas where no broadband service is available. Now, this is a small number, is about half a percent of all residents, but it's 50,000 people who in LA have zero access to any kind of broadband service. Now, our second finding, and possibly more uh, relevant overall, is that as Commissioner Clyburn said, there's very little competition between broadband service providers overall and particularly in LA. And to do that, we mapped by every city block which provider is offering what kind of service to every city block in LA County. And what we found is that only a third, only one third of the residents in LA have two or more choices in ISPs. So the majority, two thirds of residents have only one choice, so they are under virtual monopoly in the provision of broadband. And as Commissioner said, that's not very different in other large metro areas in, in LA. And of course, lack of competition is associated with high prices and less innovation, less innovation in services and in business models. And that has very serious implications for, for adoption. So turning to adoption, uh, we mapped for LA County uh, the adoption of home broadband. Um, and what we noticed um, is what one of my colleagues described as a donut pattern. And of course you imagine where the center of the donut is, where less than half of the homes have internet access. And it's very much around here, around South and Central LA, 
literally 10 or 15 blocks from my very office at USC is where folks have the least access. And of course, um, this is largely driven by income, but not only by income. There's some interesting racial divides. For example, white residents are 20 percent points in Los Angeles more likely to have internet and PC at home than a black or a Latino resident. And the same goes for other disadvantaged groups like seniors, people with disabilities, and so on. So the irony, the irony that we heard uh, in I think very well reflected in the previous panels, is that arguably the people that most need to be connected to get a better job, to um, have a course online, do research online, the students. Uh, Marco was talking about having remote medical access from Argentina, my home country. Mm. Um, those are the folks less like, least likely to be connected. <coughs> so the digital divide is both reflecting the inequalities but also exacerbating, it's exacerbating this large social disparities that characterize not only Los Angeles, but all the metro areas in, in the United States. Um, so I want to finish up with, with um, one a last data point, which I think is interesting. Um, a lot of people talk about mobile broadband. They say, well, the real solution to the low income people and the black and Latino, that's mobile. Um, and, and, and there's somewhat of an urban myth that mobile is going to solve our connectivity problems. And we clearly show that's not the case. Um, for example, if you look at LA, only 5%, only 5% of households in LA are what we call mobile only. So they don't have DSL, they don't have dial up, they don't have fiber, they don't have cable, they have only mobile. Only 5% of households in LA County rely on mobile. Now, if you look at low income population, that goes up to 7%. So it goes up from five to seven, two percentage points. Now that's a lot in terms of the relative percentage, that's 40% more, but those two percent make a small, very small impact in terms of the overall connectivity of the low income population. It's, in fact, it's only a three percent increase to the overall amount of connectivity in the low income population. <coughs> so um, from our data, we believe that mobile broadband is clearly not the solution to the connectivity problems of the low income uh, folks of, of black or Latino residents. So this is a really quick snapshot of our research. Um, there's a lot more on our website. Uh, Jessica, I, I hope somehow we can um, make folks uh, um, who are connected. We'll, we'll uh, put it in the uh, Facebook Live, yes, we, in we, the we, comments, look for it. We, we and, have, uh, we'll we blast have a it really out. nice interactive tool where you can browse by city block, by area, uh, the, the state of connectivity in your neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Hernan, potentially the, the most concise academic I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, we'll take it over to Denise to talk about what she uses the internet for. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, so like Jessica introduced me, I, um, I'm an artist and I'm a writer. And I started a family about 19 years ago. I have six kids, so when my oldest was a baby i felt very isolated my motherhood so i kind of stumbled upon the internet this was 1997 internet was fairly new at that time and uh reached out to other mothers really um breastfeeding help um childbirth all those good things and several years down the line i kind of um started my own blog i spent so much time on the internet that my husband suggested why don't you just start your own blog your own journal so for several years probably about three to four years i was just writing stories to myself on this little website that was called paramama which was just a username that i had chosen years ago and um that quickly became um kind of like my source of livelihood i've been doing this for 11 years now and still telling stories about family and um, I'm Latina, so my culture, uh, my children, uh, sharing what I do, which is art, I'm an artist. But what I quickly realized was this became a platform for myself and um, to reach other Latinas because growing up as a little girl, I did not see any kind of depictions of people like myself. Brown skin, uh, curly hair, maybe spoke Spanglish, family spoke Spanish. Um, the food we ate, I didn't see that on TV, I didn't see that in magazines, I did not see that, I didn't hear it in music uh, or in books, it was hard to find, you know, in my library at school. So um, I decided that I was going to share as much of that, as much of my own culture and myself 
on my blog so that people it could be out there and people could read about it and people can say hey i okay i i know what you're talking about i i have a similar background I, I, that's my culture too i eat that food my family speaks this and um like i said that has become my livelihood that's how i support my six kids um i write stories i work with brands um gosh i share my artwork all those things like if i did not have <laughs> if i did not have the internet i could not do any of those things i email every day with potential clients that's how i sign my contracts for any work that i do um like there's very little in the way of signing papers these days everything is on the internet and that's um i didn't realize that when i started like in 97 writing these little simple stories about family and you know this is what my one-year-old did today i did not think at all that i it would lead me to where i am now where i'm able to share what i do share what i love and uh be and be at home and be able to take care of my kids and have that flexibility to support them and still do what I love and do what I'm good at. So it's, it's that's all, that's all I'd say. <laughs> I, I, I could not really, I could not function without access to the internet. So that's why I'm here. Beautiful, thank you. We're gonna come down the line and go to Tia. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Tia Oso. I'm the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and I'm going to share a bit about how we use um, the internet and mobile technology in our organizing, and then also why it's important for Black immigrant communities. Um, so uh, BAJI is a national organization. We have offices in New York City, in Oakland, California, here in LA, as well as Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and then as Jessica shared in my introduction, we have a national membership network that's now over 50 organizations strong, as well as individuals, um, people who are working and serving in Black immigrant and African American communities. Um, and uh, like Denise has shared, like the internet has enabled us to be able to connect with communities across the country. And we use um, our online resources both to um, educate communities and connect with our members for campaigns and things like online petitions um, and, you know, Twitter rallies and social media to raise awareness around communities to um, for advocacy work, right? So to target um, decision makers um, and to educate them about why the issues are, as well as um, increased access. So it's not many people that know exactly who the <laughs> Department of Homeland Security Chair is, right? But by creating digital toolkits, we're able to educate our communities and then have them to raise their voices and talk about the issues that are impacting them directly to decision makers using the internet. And it wouldn't be possible um, if they didn't have that access to be able to do that. Everyone can't afford to get to Washington, D.C., right? Or to get downtown um, and especially when we're talking about black immigrant folks um, very similarly situated to um, African-American communities and we have a report called the state of black immigrants which shares demographic information as well as um, the impact of mass criminalization on black immigrant communities you know these are people who are working people um, who are working jobs that don't give them again the flexibility or the access to be able to be on Capitol Hill right or at the state capitol in the middle of the day and so being able to send a tweet being able to communicate um, via tech and mobile technology like um you know uh what is it called whatsapp right and different uh messaging um apps is both important for the advocacy work and organizing work and this is also how our communities communicate and stay in touch with one another across um countries and you know as they're kind of multinational family ties and so it's really important to be able to have the internet access to have it to be able to be affordable as well as mobile technology um both for their own family personal situations as well as for the organizing um and then you know we're a small organization or a small nonprofit, and so being able to leverage um, internet access in order to communicate with um, our constituents all around the country. I can deliver and I do deliver trainings via webinar. We had a webinar just yesterday using Zoom where we had, you know, over 50 attendees from all across the country that I was able to communicate with, you know, from our office just here in LA. So it also, it makes the impact of our work, you know, broader and more um, relevant 
in than just just our local area by being able to use you know mobile technology and it's also better for the environment right to not have me uh, flying all over the country even though I do also do that um, and then also really uh, critically increasingly for people who are trying to adjust their status or people who are detained or deported a lot of the information a lot of the forms that people need um, are only available online um, it's not uh, every community that has a U.S. Citizenship and Naturalization Services office, you know, near to them. And so they have to be able to get that information online. Or sometimes if they are able to get it um, from a local organization, they don't have the necessary translations because of the different languages that black immigrants speak. Um, and even for people who are in detention, um, their family members, there are forms that they have to complete in order to be able to visit and talk to their family members. Um, and so again, if you don't have the internet, you don't have the ability to do that. Um, and as an organization, net neutrality is really an important cause um, that Baji has championed and we've given congressional testimony on this issue because we realize that the digital, the digital divide is both a racial justice <laughs> issue as well as an equity issue and the internet has been a really powerful tool for organizing, um, for, you know, introducing black immigrant narratives. Also, like Denise was sharing, you know, um, people don't necessarily know and understand, you know, who black immigrants are and that they're in our communities. And so, you know, Baji has a blog. We do a lot of writing and op-eds and story sharing um, using online tools as well. And so it's important for a myriad of reasons. Um, and I know as an organizer, there's no way that my organizing would have been as impactful. We've been able to win campaigns where we had um, USCIS um, successfully initiated a program for Haitian family reunification parole um, because of our digital campaign, you know, um, Reunite Haitian American Families. And even right now, as we're fighting for the redesignation of temporary protective status for Haiti, we're using online tools, we're using um, Twitter, we're using social media, both to deliver tools for people to call and, you know, fight in person as well as online to elevate the conversation. Um, and so that's my testimony. That's what I'll share. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back with a, with a round of questions here. Um, we're going to you, Tess. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Commissioner, for listening to us today. Um, I'm going to start a little bit about my personal story, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more about what 18 Million Rising does. Actually, when I was thinking about the, uh, I want to thank the speakers from the first half of this um, a forum just because it was so moving to hear where people come from and to, to think about how um, internet is something that we, we so often take for granted. I was thinking actually about um, uh, when I was a teenager, internet was, we you had to get it through a, a little CD and you had to put it in your computer and it was through AOL. It was free for 30 days. And we were, we were low income at that time. And the only way I had access to the internet was we kept setting up 30 day accounts and just keep using the free DVDs or free CDs that were that would come through to our house and I don't know how many of you remember that but that was that was what I was thinking about is that we we figure out ways to make this access happen um, when uh, when when you really need to get things done um, uh, my family comes from Bangladesh uh, I am Muslim I'm South Asian I was raised in Southern California um, and I was raised in a very strict household I wasn't let out past uh, past when the streetlights went on, um, and so for me, the, I have to be Bangladesh. Yeah, I know <laughs> everyone, a lot of people. Um, but those those internet chat rooms that I used to be able to connect and find other people that were Muslim like me and South Asian like me, and I was able to create a virtual community because you know the high school I went to didn't have anyone that looked like me, and I needed to find that community and make those connections and. The internet turned into a place where I really um, was able to find community that was at the intersection of being Muslim and South Asian and uh, understanding what my Asian American political identity was. I started out, uh, much like you, uh, I, w I had a blog. I was a blogger at CP Mutiny, which was the largest South Asian American blog at the time. And um, on that site, I really learned to develop my identity and learned what issues were happening to the South Asian community. I now have a podcast called Good Muslim, Bad Muslim Podcast. We just got an award from the city of Los Angeles, an activism award on Saturday, um, which is, thank you. Um, 
and we recorded at the White House last year. And well, this podcast has been around for two years, and it's a podcast where me and my friends are Nurbash. We are two Muslim feminist women, and we just have a conversation. Did and they talk about you on uh, PBS or something? Else? We we get talked about it. A lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, um, what I love about our show is that what really started our, sh- our, our conversation to happen is that other people were constantly telling us, mainstream media is constantly telling us how Muslim women are supposed to behave. And this podcast allows us to work outside of mainstream media, outside of corporate structures of what media is supposed to be, and we are able to create our own voice in our own do-it-yourself way. And that's, um, that's what I love about all the projects I've been involved with on the internet. We uh, don't have to be dependent on corporate structures. We create our own blogs, we create our own podcasts, we create our own media, and we create our own space when no one else is providing that for us. And we live in a society where as people of color, as Muslim and as women, that space isn't provided for us. Um, on the professional side of what I do, I've been working as an activist, uh, getting out the vote for uh, Asian American communities for the past 15 years. And I wasn't thinking about speaking about it until you mentioned that um, that I have been running phone banks for many, many years in the Asian American community. Now, the phone bank I just did in the 2014 election reached out in 17 different languages. It's because we're in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is 15% Asian Americans. Uh, We have a population of 1.5 million in LA. We have a population of 5.5 million in California. And there's about 34 different ethnicities that exist within LA County. And because there are 34 ethnicities within Asian Americans, within that, you also have the subcategories of different languages. So to actually honestly reach everyone in our community, you have to reach people multilingually and in culture to to these folks. And it's been a very difficult process trying to figure out, well, where are the Samoan phone numbers and how do we call Samoan people with people from the Samoan community in their language to empower them and to get them civically engaged. Um, The work that we do at 18 Million Rising is much like uh, the work that Tia does, uh, except we do it for the Asian American community. We do digital media advocacy. Um, And just some things, the the point that I wanna, uh, the takeaway point that I wanna leave you with, I have have like five. You got 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds. <laughs> the, the, I'll go with, um, the, it, there is the model minority myth. The model minority myth is saying that Asian Americans have more privilege than other people of color. But the truth is that there are a lot of Asian Americans that are low income, that have uh, lots of poverty, and because of this, they don't have access to the finances um, to access the internet the way um, that most mainstream communities do. Um, And I think that's often a myth that is perpetuated and I wanted to make sure that I myth busted in this conversation to let you know that, you know, there are poor Asian Americans out there and there are a lot of disparities that affect Asian Americans. And I have other things to say, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wait. Thank you so much. And we're gonna take it to Sylvia. And then I have one question for the panel and then I'll allow Commissioner Clyburn, of course, to cut me off at any time. But we'll go to Sylvia and then I just have one for y'all. So hi everybody, thank you for having us this evening. Thank you Commissioner Flyburn and the organizers for organizing this event and for the wonderful stories that we've heard tonight. Um, So my name is Sylvia Moore, I'm Southern California organizer for California Common Cause. And we're a 45 year old national organization dedicated to uh, making our democracy stronger. So I'm gonna talk briefly about how the open internet Um, increases political participation and civic engagement. And just a little personal story about me really briefly. I actually found Common Cause through the internet. Um, I was was a journalist for a few years and I I left that job and I couldn't find um, any employment. So I decided I was gonna do some volunteer work. I found a website called Volunteer Match and I found Common Cause through um, a listing on Volunteer Match uh, looking for volunteers to start up their uh, media reform project, um, which I hope I can talk a little bit about later. Um, but so I volunteered for a number of years and I was able to put that volunteer work on my resume eventually and I found myself back with this wonderful organization years later. Um, so 
Basically, part of making our democracy stronger is ensuring that as many people as possible participate. And the open internet is crucial to civic engagement. And for example, um, thanks to um, online voter registration made possible for the first time in 2012, Californians can use the open internet to be part of our democracy. So the Secretary, our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, has credited California's recent surge in the number of registered voters in California, partly to the success of online voter registration. So basically, online voter registration makes voting easier and more convenient. Um, so how does net neutrality further civic engagement? First of all, voters can inform themselves online. So people can find out who their representatives are by um, going to uh, different websites where you can put in your address and you can and your representatives will be will pop up there on, on the page. And they can communicate their concerns online to their representatives. They can re-propose legislation online. Um, they can find out um, through a, a system called CalAccess, which the state of California runs, um, what funding sources different candidates have, where the funding sources are coming from, where they're getting their campaign funds from. Um, people have access to lots of thousands of independent news sources that include political bloggers who are able to challenge prevailing coverage and views of mainstream media sources. Second, as we've heard um, earlier, activists organize online. So for instance, um, our organization, um, which was founded by an Angelino John Gardner, who was a, a cabinet member in the Lyndon Johnson administration. Um, he was from Los Angeles. Um, so our organization, um, an open internet is so important to our work because we're able to communicate to our more than 800,000 members nationwide. And when we, we need to inform our members about pending legislation or policy, we can quickly mobilize them and have them contact their elected representatives. And we also do petition drives as well. And thirdly, the community can debate issues of the day online. So an open internet can guarantee that the public can speak and be heard without interference from corporate uh, internet service providers. And net neutrality ensures that nonprofit, independent, and diverse voices can break through the corporate media and connect with their target audiences without the threat of internet service providers censoring them. So an open an internet is not a luxury, it is a public good. And gutting net neutrality, net neutrality would be bad for consumers, detrimental to civic engagement, and would be bad for our democracy. Affordable access to the open internet is essential. And net neutrality is the difference between full participation in our democracy and second class citizenship. And so we must never compromise our hard won open internet protections. We have to fight to preserve them. So, thank you. You're here. So uh, we've been throwing around open internet and net neutrality, and you know, I think there's some people who know what that is and some people who aren't quite sure and some people who don't know it all. So I just want to define those terms. This is the idea that once you get online, your voice can be heard just as easily as someone who has a lot of money. That, you, that big companies can't buy their way to better access to audience than regular people. And so I'd like to come back to Denise and Taz for a second and ask you, what would it mean for you if, you're, if you had to pay extra to reach your audience at a faster speed? What, it, what would it mean if you had to compete with very big content providers who are well moneyed to get your message out there? What would it mean for you financially? Denise, what would it mean for your activism, Taz? And we'll, st we'll, start, we'll start with Denise and then, or Taz and then, De then Denise. Um, for, for us, it would be a big, the thing that I keep thinking about is that one of the great things about our podcast is that because the Muslim community is really spread apart, we often get fan mail from people like a Muslim 16 year old girl out in the middle of Oklahoma who doesn't have access to a community. And somehow through 
through Facebook or however she found, finds us, she finds us and she sends this very heartwarming email saying that, you know, I didn't know people like you existed. I thought I was the only one. And then we also get the other email that also comes from the middle of nowhere, but this time it's, it's a white male who's never heard a Muslim voice before. And this is their one time where they have access to that voice and they, they are really um, uncomfortable with the fact that we don't, we don't center the conversation on their language and we recenter it around our language, but they're learning. And they are um, sending gratitude emails saying, I never would have had access to, to this kind of conversation if it wasn't for this kind of a podcast. So I think for us, if we had to pay, we don't, we, we are so grassroots, we don't have advertising, because we never actually really figured it out. We don't have anything. So we're, we're using our own funds for a lot, of, a lot of this. And we wouldn't know how to compete with BuzzFeed. There's all these huge corporations that are working in the podcast world, which we don't have access to competing with. And we, we frankly enjoy working outside of that system because we don't want to work in a commercialized capitalist system when it comes to giving our voice. We want to work in a revolutionary kind of a way where our voice isn't uh, monetized. And we're being very intentional to try to, try to keep that um, genuineness there. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just pass it on to you. Um, I mean, I feel the same way. <laughs> Um, there's no way I could possibly compete. I mean, I'm a mom that's sitting in her home office with just uh, my computer and the thoughts of my mind. I have a limited budget, you know, I, I could, there's no way I could possibly compete. Um, what I do have is my community that I built of this past 11 years. Um, I have friends that have made, I mean, relationships that I've cultivated online. Uh, through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of these things. And whenever I have something to share or I have a, like a, a blog post that I posted or I have a photo, I have the, all these networks of people that will share them for me. And I mean, it's reciprocal. I mean, reciprocated. I share their things. They share my things. And um, that's so that, gra that grassroots thing that you're talking about. That's it for me. But I couldn't possibly compete. I couldn't possibly compete. We have five minutes, Commissioner, if you have any questions, uh, or we could turn it over to an open mic. It's really, I, I defer to you. Okay, well, I wanna thank our panelists then and bring up Brandy back up to the stage. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Can we get one more round of applause for all the people who have spoke tonight and shared their stories? Um, we have about a, a few minutes for a couple of questions and comments, and then we'll turn it over to Commissioner Cleburne for final reflections. Um, also, if folks are like, for some reason, unable to get your question out in the short span of time, we do have some cards over there for folks to um, write them down. But if you could like put your hands up, and I know one person um, who's already had her hand up for like the last hour, so I'm gonna kick it over to you, Miss uh, Suzette Shaw. Thank you. Yes, so uh, my name is Suzette Shaw. I am a Skid Row resident, and um, I'm a poet as well. Uh, I'm a writer. Um, I, I write, talk, and advocate Skid Row from a woman's perspective. I also am a woman who turned 53 years old yesterday. Um, um, so I lived in that other community and I was displaced to Skid Row over four years ago. All of this is important simply because, um, you know, tonight I was late um, because I was waiting for um, my property manager to pay for my rent off of my $221 a month that I received as a GR recipient. So I want you to understand, um, I live off of this phone. This is an Obama phone, what we call it here in our community. Yeah. Um, Wi-Fi, it's hella hard to come by in my community. My community, my community right here in Skid Row. So um, I want you to understand what I have to do to try and um, do the blogging that I do and do the writing and do the poetry and all the things that you all are talking about. I'm a, I'm a mental health care advocate also. So um, I've been in a mental health program through Mental Health of America where I was having to commute from Long Beach and, um, and Commerce and, um, 
and off of my $221 because I didn't get any extra money for my community nor for my lunch or anything else and, and during the course of my program. So, um, and, and my program, you know, we get um, done by four or five o'clock and then I'd have to try and get back downtown to um, get to the library to try and, you know, use to do my, my, my homework my homework because it had to be due in be, before mid, by midnight that night. And, um, and, and then when all the advocacy work that I do here in the community, um, I don't get to do webinars because this is all I have. So, um, and, and, and you should see what I have to go through trying to struggle, trying to hijack the Wi-Fi that I do have. And, and I can't go outside of my door to do it because if I go outside of my door, then the men think that, oh, well, you know, I'm just trying to make myself available for them, even if it's at midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning. So, and, and then even during the day, if, if I want to go outside of my door, you know, there, there was this, there's this, there's yelling and there's screaming and well, you know, most of us women who've been displaced here to Skid Row, we're trauma survivors. So, you know, that's really, really hard on me. But you know, you don't know these things about us because we look like this and we still trying to stay in our respectability mm -hmm. as women here living in Skid Row. But I want you to understand, I am, I'm hurt, I have to say. And I was late, and I'm sorry that I was late, but I had to get that rent paid because otherwise I would incur fractions tomorrow. But I, I have to say that I, I, am, I am hurt, and, I, and I'm offended that this conversation is happening in my community, yet, Again, our faces are blacked out and our voices are muted when we, when we talk about poverty, this is poverty right here. Skid Row houses the highest homeless population in the United States of America. Women living here in Skid Row, we live way, way, way below the poverty level. Year after year, decade after decade, the numbers went up 20% last year. Black women, homeless, living in poverty, lowest on the pay scale. I want you to understand, our voices should always be at the table, especially when they're in our community. Thank, Thank you. because it is a machine and we do not control that. Mm -hmm. So um, in very briefly expressing some of the impediments or the obstacles that I have experienced, um, I, I'd like to first of all reference the fact that when I have used the internet and I have been in pursuit of a job, for instance, I've been trying to get published, I can create an online file and because I believe I am a, a community activist, quite often that application is um, deleted, because of Homeland Security or those that are not proponents of, of those that are making changes in the community. Um, we do not have complete control over the information that we are sharing. And it can quite often lead to obstacles towards submitting these applications, towards our being uh, considered for our jobs. I mean, like I said, public publishing my book. Um, the, the screen to, in my computer or my smartphone is quite often uh, frozen. Again, I don't know if this, the powers that be, Homeland Security, those that do not want us to have any voice or, or dissemination of our information in the first place. So while we can use the internet, uh, I, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, I'm also, I guess, in an exposition of some of uh, the impediments that I have experienced even while using my smartphone. I've had people come into my room and just sit on my computer. Again, um, hacking into my phone, uh, hacking into my phone and, uh, and my emails. So while we can use the internet to our advantage, I'd also like to say be an exposition towards how it is used in the maintenance of the status quo as well. Not just as a single black woman who has experienced much of what my colleague just expressed, but uh, again in uh, in um, characters. I mean in identity theft and in misrepresentation as well. 
I've had people that have created files and used information or created identities that, that I never, uh, at, that I never um, uh, authorized. So again, it, I'm, I do believe that we should be able to still have face-to-face -face communication dialogue. I'm just 411 quite personally. I mean, it's, it's very difficult sometimes for me to even access information, though I do have a smartphone because we do not control that machine. And that way it's quite possibly part of the mark of the beast because if we are not recognized on the internet, we have no identity, none whatsoever. Not just for the poor people, homeless people, disenfranchised people. Again, it's, it's really a maintenance of the status quo unless uh, you know, we have that, uh, again, we were politically correct because these people that are not politically correct, like myself, because we are an advocate of recognition of people that are in the trash or that those that the city or the, the powers that be are still trying to marginalize. Again, either that information is compromised or we're just denied access or even voice at all. So I just wanted to expose that, but um, if there's anything that you all can do to make that equanimity transparent, we'd appreciate this. Again, I've been trying to get published for years. Whenever I refer or try to reopen my file, it has been deleted. Understood. So whether this is counterintelligence, whoever it is, if you have the authority, please expose and stop this. Thank That's you. Right. That's Thank a you. fallacy. Thank you. All right. Right. All right. Thank I appreciate we got a little, what, I think one more question. One more question. Uh, the lady with, um, in denim. Denim jacket. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. My name is Catherine Benamou. I teach uh, media studies at UC Irvine, I'm down in Orange County. Um, first, I just want to make an observation. Um, many of my students are first generation students, and some of them do not have access unless they go to the library. So this problem is not just K through 12, it goes into higher education as well. Um, and so the first thing is that the importance of public libraries. Uh, keeping libraries open in communities uh, not all of my students live on campus. Some of them commute. They often live with their parents. It's very, very important. Uh, there's heavy, I live in Long Beach, actually. There's heavy use of the libraries for internet access. Uh, and I've noticed that it, it also is a resource for many homeless people who, who live in Long Beach. The second um, suggestion that I have, I, mean, I know New York City has implemented kiosks, smart yes. kiosks. Yes. And I'm wondering if there's any possibility, I mean, uh, I think part of that was oriented toward tourism, but of course we can rethink that and think of it as a resource because I know some people who've gone homeless and the big problem is finding resources. There used to be phone books at public phones. <laughs> now we don't have those anymore. So how do people know where to get services? So you mentioned something interesting up. because mm -hmm. um, what they, uh, the, the program you're talking about, what New York City did was take those abandoned physical telephone, the, the old pay phones, and convert them into Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so that what that did is basically kind of lift the community, you know, in that vicinity, and, um, you know, giving, the, giving um, those, you know, opportunity to be connected outside of McDonald's so you don't have to look like me. Uh, or, you know, I, you, know you, you don't have to be tethered, you know, to, um, you know, someone else's environment that you may or may not be welcome. So you're absolutely right, you know, that's using an, an abandoned property uh, to, to really uh, serve the community. So you just highlighted, you know, a, a number of issues that, um, you know, connectivity, you know, at home, um, affordability, you know, at home or on, on your person, all of these things are important. And that's what the FCC is supposed to be doing. Um, you know, if you look at what our charter or, or what the Communications Act says, you'll see um, words like just reasonable and, and, and fair rates. You see things, you know, you know, when you talk about advanced services, which today means uh, broadband. And we're supposed to be about um, leveling the playing field uh, when it comes to communities. It's not just about rural uh, communities, it's about urban and suburban uh, communities. It's not just about rich communities, it's about communities um, uh, that, that are economically challenged, uh, that are, you know, um, the, the other sides of the track, as we say, um, you know, down south. It shouldn't be this hard. Let me just be more plain spoken, because I'm from the other south. <laughs> it shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't be this hard to be connected. 
It shouldn't be this hard to, to keep a dial tone. You, it shouldn't be uh, this hard uh, to, to have services and opportunities. And the FCC is the one place I believe that can a enable um, a lot of this uh, to happen. And to be honest with you, you need to challenge us because I say that our report card is not an A. It is not an A. I'm struggling to give us a B. Now that's just, I, I am. Because we're not doing everything we need to do to close the opportunities divide for the places uh, where we don't frequent, where we don't visit enough. Now that's just the truth. So it's up to you to continue to be that voice, to challenge us. To, I shouldn't be the first or last commissioner to come to Skid Row and sit in here with you and say, what can I do for you and what should we do? I shouldn't be the first or last. So they've got to hear from you. Now, look, I'm gonna close up and say what you already know. Broadband for me is the greatest equalizer of our time because it enables us to do everything to better realize our dreams, to close gaps quickly, to learn you know, more abundantly, to be connected with people that we couldn't afford to pick up the phone and call. It enables us to not only be connected to others, but to get to know ourselves better and to realize our highest uh, uh, potential. These gaps, I believe, persistent gaps in our communities don't have to remain. Because I believe that government officials and a lot of well-meaning individuals think there should always and will always be a permanent, um, you know, a, 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 a permanent, how do I want to say this? Because I don't want to be insulting. That the issues that we have, the economic challenges, the challenges of providing services to community, better health care. I think some people believe that there's always going to be those who do not have, and I, I'm ashamed to say there might be some people who believe there's, there's those who should not have. I don't subscribe to that, and neither do you. Whatever our persistent poverty issues, mental health issues, educational challenges, whatever the challenges that we have that we've been talking about ever since we've been on this planet, I think that there's a solution that's within our grasp, within our lifetime, to solve. And I think broadband connectivity is that conduit that will get us there quickly. And so you have to not ask, but demand from your public officials locally, from a state level, and absolutely from the FCC to close those remaining gaps and put a plan forth today to do so. Stop ignoring, and let me get this, Angelina, I'm gonna get that right, wrong. Did I say it right? Angelinos. Stop ignoring Angelinos. Stop making assumptions that every block is connected, no matter what the broadband map says. We know it's not accurate. The professor has told you, you know, that there are, there are people um, who are not connected. People should not have to choose between paying for water bills, paying for rent, eating, and being connected. We shouldn't have to choose. So we've got work to do. And you can't get, afford to get tired of the work that we have to do. And you can't afford to be silent to let people like me know that we have work to do. So look, we've got two choices. Speak up or stay where we are. There's nobody in this room who's satisfied with where we are as a nation, where we are as a community. So that means you can't stay silent. That means that by the time I get home, back to my adopted home in DC, Friday morning, if half of this room I have not heard from, weighing in on that open internet item, then you don't get an A either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cobham.
So we do have um, cards. They're not much, but if folks can like jot down the, their stories around the open internet, we will be submitting those into um, the docket as well as um, if folks can go online, fcc.gov is where you can also file a comment. Um, thank you so much to everybody for coming out. Thank you for sharing your stories. A special thank you to the residents of Skid Row. Um, and good night. Thank you.